your side, Minister. Yes, sure. And Natasha Day is Head of Strategic Housing and Regeneration. And myself, obviously, Minister for Housing and Communities, and uh, Carly uh, Cudlip, who's my personal secretary, private secretary. OK, thank you, Minister. And uh, as I said, welcome to this quarterly hearing. Obviously, some exciting times coming up for you in your Absolutely. capacity as Housing Minister. Sure. And we know that uh, very, very shortly next week, we're going to have uh, an in-committee debate mm -hmm. on the residential tenancy law proposals. I mean, would you like to just start off, because it's obviously very much of the moment, and, and just give us uh, your expectations with, in regards to the debate next week and how you hope that the debate will inform the proposals moving forward? Sure. So, obviously, an in-committee debate is one where we're, we're sort of gathering opinions and views and it's not I, one thing I just want to very quickly say, this is not we are in listening mode. We are collecting information. And it's interesting to see so many people in this room, because I think it's important that we take on board all these views and, and opinions to clarify how we are going to move forward. So that, that is the, the biggest thing I want to help us with the law on that front. I think the areas which we've highlighted, which have been missing for many, many years, um, are around the social housing sector and how they've been looked after. And we've had some issues, obviously, recently under the Jersey Homes Trust. And we've now decided we want to bring them back in, into scope, as it were, within underneath, underneath the residential tenancy law. So basically trying to put both social housing and private uh, um, landlords on a level footing and tenants on a, on a level footing in, in that area. The other areas are around... Um, pulling lots of old laws back into under one heading. So this is a 1946 law uh, in connection with uh, the setting up the rent tribunal, which we failed miserably to get through uh, the, the assembly uh, some time ago. And we want to bring that under the scope of the law and also widen its remit. So those are areas like that. We're also looking at, and there are various uh, ideas around tenancies and looking at open-ended tenancies and, con and considering that. And we're obviously getting a lot of feedback on whether that's uh, a, a good move or otherwise, and uh, uh, and those areas. We're looking at also how we protect not just tenants, but also landlords in these scenarios, which is why I'm talking about the housing tribunal being more than just simply a rent setter, but also someone to whom both landlords and tenants can turn to in the case of having uh, issues in that area. Um, yeah, I think those are some of the, the sort of the headline, headline figures. Okay, so... Uh... Uh, we've got, uh, we've got this debate next week. Yeah, um, yeah. We're aware that Jersey Landlords Association have asked for more detail provided yeah. to that. Have you, got, have you got any more publications mm. that you're going to put out uh, to the public before we go into next week, or will you be looking to have the debate inform the next stage of uh, changes? Well, I, I think what we're doing already, we are already collecting information. We're already being, uh, receiving emails on queries. In fact, I met with uh, one individual yesterday for an hour um, to go through their concerns uh, with regard to the proposals. Uh, I think what we're going to use is we're going to use the in-committee debate as a sounding board uh, to see where we're at in, and see what people's views are. And we're going to break that down into very carefully choreographed sections so that we don't have a, you know, um, a, 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 a Trying to find the right, right word for it, just so we have an ordered, an orderly debate. Put free it that way. Free for all was the one that came to mind. Sorry, a free for all. A free for all. Yeah, thank you. Yes, mind. I don't want a free for all. So, so, so do, you, do you envisage breaking down any proposition into sections? Well, that's right. So we're going to break it down into four four areas, and maybe Natasha, you can maybe just give me the four four areas which we're we're putting it down into. Uh, so thank you. Lodged uh, as a further ask, the state assembly to provide some structure around uh, the infancy debate. So we're, we're envisaging it's going to be a half day uh, debate, breaking into a, a thought, four thematic sections. Uh, the first being on tenancy types, notice periods, and termination. The second part being rents and charges. The third being minimum expectations for the provision of social housing. And the fourth being powers of investigation of offences and penalties and the creation of housing tribunals. So one hour apart. And of course, the, the bailiff will help to manage the structuring of the debate and will um, uh, have flexibility to extend or, or shorten those periods as may uh, be, be necessary. Um, I wonder if I might um, add a, a part in terms of the wider context of the consultation. So um, the minister has published uh, his, his, his paper, which he's been uh, calling a white paper as a summary of policy intent. So this is to deal with the high level um, direction of travel that the, the minister is, is currently finding himself upon on the key 
uh, policy areas. And of course, many of those areas are, are quite significant changes uh, for the rental market um, between landlords and tenants and their relationships, minimum obligations. And you can expect to see there be some uh, a broad range of views against each of those things. So what the paper doesn't try to do is uh, cover off all the detail and the specifics as how it will operate in practice. It's to deal with the principles of what uh, the minister is trying to achieve. What must follow is uh, the very fine and very important detail and the nuance that sits alongside those policies. So it, in relation to your question as to whether or not further information is going to come at this stage, what we're hoping is that tenants, landlords, states members will provide their views on the high level um, statements of first <coughs> intent and raise their um, any concerns or issues that they want to highlight that will help us develop the detail or, if necessary, potentially change the direction. So that, that's how uh, this paper is meant to function. It's about policy intent. The detail follows and hopefully the detail will be informed by the rich debate in the Assembly and the consultation feedback that is received over the next two months. So these are quite extensive proposals, Minister, which cover mm. a number of different laws and uh, we understand you're trying to bring everything Absolutely. together so that it all works together much better. Mm. But are you not concerned that in doing that, we leave behind some issues which really are right of the moment. And I mean, it's a tenant, let's say ten, tenants' rights, for example. Mm -hmm. Do you not think in waiting till next year that there's some urgent stuff that really we should be trying to tackle at the moment? I know I might be playing devil's no. advocate, but no. there are, you know, it's not all <clears throat> great that we're waiting and getting yeah. it all together. And just on that commentary, I mean, this has been a made a comment about waiting. Um, we're not actually waiting or there's no further delay. We already have um, uh, lawmakers, you know, working through the law at this moment in time. And they have been, uh, the, I'm trying to, I'm using the word lawmaker. That's not quite the right term, is it? Law uh, 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 officers. So that started beginning at the process the beginning of uh, last year. OK, so we have this background work going on at the moment. And that the idea is that by the time we've had our debate, we've had our thoughts on this, the end of this year, we should be able to produce something which is going to be a law which will be then put in, well, well obviously the Assembly will have to vote on that, there's, there's, we're not avoiding the Assembly, but we want to have a brand new law in place by the first quarter of next year. Now, I don't see, uh, and I'm conscious that um, a colleague of mine in reform has, has lodged a proposition, uh, and I don't see how they believe that they can do things faster than we can do that, um, sure, given that sure. we require this consultation period, because I can't emphasise enough, it is so important important that we consult um, because I do not want to be going down one route and only to find that actually the rest of the world wants us to go somewhere else. So I think it's really important that we yeah, consult well, on well, those, you, those you areas. are obviously the, the minister, minister yeah. Yeah. and uh, one hopes, of course, that you've considered that there might be small, urgent mm -hmm. amendments to a specific yeah. law which you could bring sooner, Yeah. but you've made a conscious decision to get everything together and Absolutely. Make sure that everything is aligned. The, the problem we have and historically have had is this piecemeal approach to uh, legislation. And it's just this constant um, little chipping away in little areas. What I'm, I'm determined to actually end that approach. I really want to see one overarching law, which is not just fit for purpose for today and sorting things out today, but in going into the future. I think what we have to recognise is the markets are, I mean, I don't like to use the term market in a housing context, but the environment in which we're operating is constantly changing. Airbnb wasn't on anybody's radar a decade ago. Now we know that there are 120 homes or whatever in Airbnb being taken out of, uh, out of, you know, whole houses that were being taken out of circulation. So what happens is, what I see is, we see the environment changes, and I feel that the law lags the 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 situation the situation uh, as it, as it as it moves forward so i'm very determined to build into our law a degree of flexibility which enables market recognizes market changes as as well as sorting out issues of today okay so in reaching that conclusion yeah. have you looked elsewhere at other jurisdictions to see how they're dealing with these problems because certainly where i go away at the moment and sure. talk to others most recently i was in in london talking <clears> to the chair of the uh, select committee that are looking at housing, they have exactly the same issues that Absolutely. we do. So have you been away and looked at other jurisdictions well, uh, for ways to move forward? My, my team will be certainly, I let Natasha enlighten you on that one. Um, so I think it, it, it's quite normal practice in making new policy that we look uh, to learn from uh, the successes and the failures of other jurisdictions. Um, what we have here though is we have our own starting point, so we have our own residential tenancy law, 
which is functioning in its own way. So it's difficult to draw direct comparisons with other jurisdictions, but certainly some learning of the successes and failures. Um, you know, Scotland have been doing um, uh, certain things in the market, European style uh, tendencies are often referred to. These are things that we're looking at, but this has to be a bespoke response for Jersey that's right for our own circumstances. But, well, I mean, the, the Minister's already mentioned open-ended tendencies. Where's that idea come from? And is that something that we've looked at from off-island? Well, it's actually something which was referenced in a report um, from 2020-2021. The I'm trying to think of the name of the report. The... Can, can you help me with that one? The no, not homelessness on the other big one. The Housing Policy Development, Development Board made some recommendations in that area. Okay, well, okay. We, we're going to come back to it. So, so, so yes. We, yeah, yeah. So, so this is an area, this was very seriously looked at and reviewed in that, in that particular report. But apologies for not remembering the name off the top of my head. Okay, so just dealing with one, one issue now, if I might. Uh, yeah. You intend to establish a formal definition for social housing, social housing yes. providers yes. and expectations. Um, how are you going to work with stakeholders and the providers of social housing to come to, to that and what will be the expectations of them? Yeah. So we're about to get some uh, meetings in the diary with individual social housing providers. So we met with social housing providers in the development of the paper to um, explain the intent and, and what's, what's driving that. Um, for your benefit, um, a, a key driver most recently has been, uh, for example, what happened with the Jersey Homes Trust and... Uh, their, their setting of rent procedures. Um, at the moment, social housing providers don't have a statutory basis, so just defining uh, what one is and how one should operate doesn't actually exist in legislation, and that's quite an important gap that we, we are trying to resolve. Um, in defining those activities, though, in what a social housing provider should do, has to take into account the individual circumstances of those social housing providers. So they all perform slightly different functions. They deliver their housing for their, their own reasons based on the trusts. And, of course, we've got Andium Homes as the own, uh, government's own social housing provider. The report also acknowledges that the parishes play a really important role in uh, providing forms of social housing, although historically not identified themselves as social housing providers. So we're very keen to talk to the parishes to see if um, embracing them within uh, the terminology of social housing provider um, would be beneficial or appropriate. So that, again, will come in direct engagement with the parishes and also the Comité uh, de Conitab as a whole. So can I just can, come well, in? I'll just yes, picking surely. up on that point. Um, do you do you <coughs> think rent, rent control is a very moot point, isn't it? Let's face it, when that will be discussed um, in the coming weeks. But uh, given the Scottish model is suggested not to work, mm. are we going down the right path? So on the matter of rent controls, mm. um, the, the report um, quite clearly uh, identifies that RPI is a suggested figure, but that more work needs to be done to very carefully mm. consider what the right measures are if ultimately we arrive at any at all. The RPI uh, increases are actually part, a part of standard tenancy agreements today, um, so it's not new. It's just I think it's the combination of a, um, the, the RPI increases with an open-ended tenancy, uh, which prevents the ability to reset a rent over the course of time of a, a continued physical tenancy of, of a tenant. Um, the, the, the measures and the issues of uh, periods of high and uh, low rates of inflation is very much a concern uh, to us and we're working with the chief economic advisor within government to make sure that we get the best possible advice before setting um, a, a form of rent control. Of course with landlords they are also going to have their views uh, about how that operates and I think the key thing to highlight is the detail that sits alongside any form of rent control um, so that it wouldn't be um, a completely binary that thou shalt not um, increased rents above RPI, that there are um, important nuances attached to that requirement or that expectation, such as if there's been a significant investment in the property um, or the, the uh, longevity of the tenancy and other things which may be helpfully picked up by a housing tribunal to arbitrate on. Mm. Just get, I think it's back important to the this social... nuance. I think we've got to really emphasise that point. <coughs> Excuse me. I just want to get back to social housing before we yes, move on again. Um, you mentioned expectations relating to the provision of social housing. Can I ask you, Minister, what, what your expectations are? Obviously, we're going to con we're, you are consulting on the definition. Mm -hmm. But what, well, are, what are your I, I think, expectations? I think what we have to think about um, as social housing is it's the most vulnerable people in our society, um, which we're dealing with here. And the 
What was very apparent from a parishal meeting um, which we had a, a few weeks back with under the Jersey Homes Trust was a was the uh, amount of notice given to these tenants. I think it was three weeks. Thankfully, Jersey Homes Trust on our request delayed their increase for a further four weeks and actually ended up delaying for um, another couple of months after that. But I think they recognised that, that that wasn't fair to their tenants. And then clearly the other issue is around, you know, if they do increase, how much notice should that be? We need to establish that uh, somewhere along the line. We obviously have Andium Homes and, who are our own sort of, uh, and I think they're kind of the benchmark level of, of how... Uh, social housing providers should act and behave. So I'd like to bring other uh, trusts uh, of different types of trusts in line with our expectations of our own uh, and Andium homes. That's That would be my expectation. In, in your discussions with social housing providers, are you finding that different ones have different uh, raison d'etre for, for doing what they are? No. Is that going to be an issue for you, setting an overall well, social well, housing I, I think this, this is a point about the consultancy process. We, we need to we need to really find out and bottom that all out. All as I do know is that um, Jersey Homes Trust has highlighted um, a, a where they've uh, sort of had a, a slightly laissez-faire um, uh, with the way they've, they've been able to operate. And so I think it's important that uh, we need to bring them back under under the overall, uh, you know, heading in this, and, and this is an opportunity to do this. And it has, you know, previous assemblies have endeavoured to try and bring in um, social housing regulators, and every time they have failed, that's another layer of, level of bureaucracy. I, I think um, what would be really helpful is that if we can use um, the setting up of a, a, a tribunal of some description, and, and that falls within, and the whole social housing issues fall within this uh, residential tenancy law, I think that will make things a lot easier for everybody to understand. Okay. Talking about consultations, yeah. uh, which is easy to talk about, but not always easy to uh, uh, put into, into place, how will you engage with migrant communities to ensure they're able to participate in consultations? Will proposals be translated into the community um, commonly spoken languages on the island to ensure everyone has their say? We're currently working on um, our, our outreach programme to mm. reach those communities in particular. So, so yesterday when we were, we were meeting with states members to talk about this, the, the tenant side and the minority groups are very much recognised as the hardest to reach people, but perhaps the most vulnerable and exposed <laughs> in, in all of these issues that we're highlighting by the paper. So it's, it's vitally important that we reach those people. We will be leaning um, on third sector groups in particular to help us with that. Um, and um, I'm very pleased that we, um, you know, we have members within our team who've got a great deal of experience working um, with those parts of the community and will be helping us in our outreach efforts. What about submissions um, during the period from any specific targeted um, stakeholders or groups? Could you detail those particular targeted groups, who they, who they may be? Well, to tomorrow, I think today or tomorrow, Carly, tell me who we're meeting with tomorrow. So to today, I think we're at uh, the Older Persons Forum. <clears throat> and who else have we got uh, lined up for? Um, learning needs um, tomorrow and um, mental health um, representatives as well. As well. Tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah. So we're trying to get involved with as many different groups as we can um, who would maybe not normally be consulted. I mean, one of the areas, obviously, Citizens Advice Bureau is a clear um, area where we can get feedback from them as well. So I think that we're going to be meeting with them as well. Mm -hmm. So it, lots of different areas, as many as we can, we want to get involved. Mm -hmm. and, and that is not just a case of relying on people emailing us. It's also a case of us going out there and meeting these people physically. What about social media engagements? Obviously, that's a strong um, <clears throat> route with many these days. Are you responding to social media? So, so, at the, so the first two weeks, the consultation has been really giving people a chance to get their head into the paper and the issues mm. and the, the themes that it's raising. Um, imminently, a, a programme of social media activity is going to start, which, I mean, we would have just had the Easter holiday, so we didn't want to start heavy engagement whilst people were trying to enjoy their, their family breaks. Um, uh, but that activity is going to start and hopefully stimulate a lot of public debate in the, um, the social media forums. Good. OK. OK. Um, uh, we're moving on to tenancy types, notice periods and termination. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Minister, <coughs> within your residential tenancy law reform proposals, there's provision mm -hmm. to control the rental eligibility criteria. No, no provision. Sorry? There's no provision. Sorry. 
No provision. That's me, sorry. No, no provision to control the rental eligibility criteria that some private landlords impose, for example, not allowing children or pets in rented accommodation. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate incorporating any of this? Um, so it is actually included um, under the regulation making powers part of the paper where we highlight homelessness and discriminatory behaviour of landlords as something to introduce in the future. Okay. Um, in compiling uh, the proposals, was any consideration given to adding to the opportunity that a tenant renting may have first time first right to purchase a property if the landlord were to terminate the res residency mm -hmm. due to selling? Could you provide details as to why this was not included in the proposals? Um, so I think we've had a, a similar proposition to that effect to the State's Assembly in the last year. Um, and our reasons for, for not supporting that would still stand. Um, there, there are a lot of complexities attached with um, introducing such a right. Um, it'd be very challenging to implement and manage, it both, I think, on both sides, and um, is not something that we're looking to pursue as part of these changes. OK. Um, in the section of, of your proposals around tenancy types, notice periods and terminations, it is noted that there will be separate categories of tenancy agreements for short-term workers and similar. Could you provide further detail as to what that what the separate categories will consist of? Well, again, we're going to fixed term and, uh, and open ended tendencies. I've is there some more detail you'd like to put on that? Yeah. So, it's um, a, again, it's about um, acknowledging the different circumstances yeah. as to why somebody might require um, rented accommodation for a period of time. So, the, the short term worker or seasonal worker, for example, is a good example of why you might want a short term tenancy. So, if somebody's only on the island for a nine month period as part of their work permit, they would have a short-term tenancy that would cover them uh, for that period of time. Um, what we do want out of this consultation process is to understand in what other circumstances a fixed-term tenancy would be appropriate, and that's finding the right balance between the option for a fixed-term tenancy and the open-ended tenancy. So there's been much talk about open-ended tenancies being the default, um, but there may be other scenarios that we need to think about very carefully where a fixed-term tenancy that isn't attached to some sort of employment requirement, but is perhaps maybe on agreement between landlord and tenant to meet your very personal specific uh, requirements. So if, if a landlord knows from day one that they intend to sell the property in uh, you know, three years time because they're, or their 18 year old child is you know, coming to an age that they want to occupy the property, we might want to factor in the ability for that mutual agreement to be made on the outset rather than it being uncertain for the period of the tenancy. Really, it, an issue for the tenant at that point in time that the, the landlord on the point of making the tenancy knew their intentions um, but the tenant wouldn't have had the benefit of that understanding so how can we um, address that nuance in the, um, uh, the the ability to create a fixed term tenancy and I'm sure landlords will have uh, some views because this is a particular area that I'm sure they're very concerned about. Sure, but, uh, surely well sorry sorry I was probably going to ask the same no, question no, no. I mean two things um you will have received some email correspondence in relation to this matter. Yes, of course. Yeah, and yeah. so what you're saying is, mm -hmm. is that the uh, landlord mm -hmm. would be able to provide some um, reasons. And, oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. And so will those yeah. reasons, mm -hmm. those acceptable reasons, mm -hmm. will you have clear criteria about what those reasons will be yep. so that everybody's aware of them? Um, because obviously this is a, a real concern for people. I agree. Uh, and, and I would just say to you, that, and this can stem from a conversation yesterday I had uh, with, a, uh, with a landlady, and that is I'm conscious there is a very limited list provided within the white paper. That list can be much more and will be much more extensive when we do that. There is a danger, however, when you start providing lists because there will always be a circumstance where you didn't quite cover that one off. Uh, and I think this is where something like the housing tribunal, uh, if we set them up appropriately, that would be where you could argue, where a discussion could be had, which is says, well, hang on, this is an appropriate situation whereby we can terminate this lease. Um, you know, and, and, and understand that. And I think sure. that's really important to, to have that. Uh, so if, yeah, this is on the basis I, I, of, I, I, sorry, I, I'm going on the basis of, of an open-ended tenancy as opposed to a fixed-term tenancy. Yeah. Okay. But if you want certainty, Minister, why would you want to make the default position an open-ended tenancy? Because that really would concern me as yeah. a landlord. If well, I, I'm not saying I want to know a default open-ended tenancy. I'm just saying it, the, this is a coverage for, in, for if, if uh, open-ended tenancy, it is determined that open-ended tenancy is a default. And I'm not saying it is default at the moment. I'm saying is we need to hear back 
feedback from everybody from our consultation period. And then once we understand um, what, in, uh, what people's thoughts are about that, and this is why I keep talking about consultancy, consultation is such an important aspect of all of this, is that we will then recognize uh, you know, people's concerns and how we should, what, uh, we talk about nuance, how we should nuance the law to enable, you know, to, to get the best outcome. Because this isn't, a, this, we, whilst we do want to protect, obviously we, we, really important we protect ten, uh, tenants, we do not want to see an, uh, uh, um, the uh, private sector landlords going out of the market. They provide a significant amount of um, accommodation on this island. And if they start to leave the market for unintended consequence, because of unintended cons consequences, because of this law, that means we've got the law wrong. Well, I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, Minister, because as you just quite eloquently pointed mm. out, there's a danger in setting all this detail mm. that, ten, uh, that landlords mm. may say, this is just too much of a challenge, I cannot commit, yep. I can't yep. see where the end of the tenancy is, I yep. can't put my prices up, the and rental can't cover mortgage payment or maintenance, and I'm just going to leave the market. And mm. we know that in the UK recently, that's a huge mm. percentage mm. of uh, and, and properties that's, left to the rental sector. And, and we recognise that. And so therefore, that is why I, I, I keep coming back to my point about this consultation period is really, really important for us. It's really important that we um, bottom out the nuances and uh, what we need to put in the law, what we leave out of the law will be determined upon uh, the 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 const, uh, you know what we receive back in feedback from individuals, which is why we're putting so much effort into meeting people, listening to people. I mean, I, I think one of my greatest concerns is that there's this pervading thought that somehow once government's made up its mind, it's going to do something, it will just do it come hell or high water. This area is way too sensitive, way too complex for us just to simply uh, say, this is how it's going to be tough. Um, we have to really listen hard, think hard, and, and, and as you can see, there is a massive amount of complexity here, and we've just got to make sure we get it as, as right as we can. Going back to uh, the consultation that the constable was talking about, there's no question, and you've already had it, you're going to get a lot of representation mm. from landlords. Absolutely. But some of the minority groups, mm -hmm. and to let, you know, let's represent them for two minutes, yep. who yep. feel under a lot of pressure Pressing. from some landlords because they uh, may not be paying, you know, they may be paying cash, mm -hmm. they may be working in difficult so they are scared to mm -hmm. complain in any way, shape or form, mm -hmm. whether that's putting in submission in, mm -hmm. in consultation. Are you confident you're going to be able to get those that really feel uh, it, it is difficult to say anything at all. Are you going to get the representation, the consultation well, from that group? Well, I think that, that this is where something like Citizen Advice Bureau will be really valuable, What their feedback, because they monitor all of their conversations. And obviously, the people who are struggling the most will be approaching organisations like that. So it's really important we get the detail from there. I think what's also interesting in the conversations which I've, which I've sort of had and seen is there is quite a different perception um, between the, the landlords who live in the um, country parishes as against those who live in town. Um, and I think you were sort of touching a bit on that, and that is that in town there we have a far larger immigrant uh, population than we do out in the in the country parishes. So I understand, and this is the, the landlady who I spoke to yesterday, I understand whereby she feels aggrieved that uh, some of the commentary made in the white paper and feels it's landlord bashing. We're, we're not trying to landlord bash. We're trying to find a, a point which both sides can feel. And I don't even like to use this, the concept of sides, but it inevitably is sides, um, because this landlady was saying, actually, we're working in partnership with our, with our tenants. So, you know, it, it really it shouldn't be us and them. It should be a very, very clear... This is what we're signing up to. I actually really want out of this is just a huge amount of transparency so that there aren't um, odd charges thrown in um, which suddenly appear, which people weren't aware of. And I think in, in with all due respect to the landlords, they, in fact, 95, 96, 99% of them probably do the right thing. Um, unfortunately, the noise is from the, those landlords, the noise against these individuals is, comes from those who do not do the right thing and, do, and clearly do not do the right thing. I, in fact, for one tiny example, very quickly, um, in my own business, I, I was speaking about this to a couple of members of my team who are tenants. And they said, well, yeah, our properties aren't the best. Um, they could do with a lick of paint or they could do with this, but I'm not actually going to say too much because 
I'm worried that my rent will be st uh, stuck up. Um, and if I complain and I don't know who to complain to, and if they, I get found out I get um, I'm complaining, um, my tenancy agreement will come to an end. Oh, and by the way, my landlord has not renewed my tenancy. It's gone out of date over the last two couple of years, but I don't know what to do. I'm really struggling to know what to do. So I know very, you know, firsthand uh, some of the issues, some of these tenants experience. So as I said, there, there are very good experiences. There are also very bad ones. And, and we're trying to work a way through a uh, 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 best piece for, for everybody. Um, OK. Yeah, um, sorry. No, that's, no. Fine. that's fine. Um, there was something I was going to ask, um, and I, it, it may very well be. Um, has any um, sort of consultation been done with um, the LOD in relation to uh, human rights? in relation to, obviously, um, the right to enjoy your own property. So I, I'm just thinking of it. I'm not an expert, but I just wondered, because obviously you, as an owner of a property, mm. I have rights, mm -hmm. and obviously as a, as a tenant. So I just wondered whether any consultation had been made with the sort of experts in relation to the human rights implications in relation to any of your proposals. Good question. <laughs> yeah, so and I'd, I'd meet as, as a matter of course, when new legislation is yeah, developed, yeah, yeah. it's tested for its compatibility with human rights. Um, I would probably highlight that there are a number of human rights at play in, in this yeah, circumstance. Yeah, yeah. It's not just about um, rights to your, the enjoyment of your own property, it's also about right to a home. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, these things have to be very carefully balanced. Some things aren't always, um, you know, it's difficult to get um, everything uh, perfectly balanced when you've got sometimes competing uh, uh, rights uh, that need to be addressed. So, of course, we'd be taking the advice of law officers just to make sure that everything that we're doing is entirely compatible with human rights. I think the question, I was aware of the the need at the end of the legislative process, that that's a tick box. Mm -hmm. But what I was asking was, some of the things that you're putting forward, mm -hmm. has that already been consulted on in relation to the LOD? So we've had um, law officers' advice uh, on the draft, uh, uh, law drafting instructions um, already. And we are engaging with the law drafting office, so uh, they haven't raised any concerns to us to date that there is an incompatibility okay. for rights. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just. Uh, yes, in relation to um, landlords and tenants um, can come to an agreement to end mm. tenancy earlier, early. Um, this is an existing provision that will be maintained. Do you anticipate that there will be a set list of reasons for which tenants or things I think I may have very well have already asked that but yes. uh, but you've said no to that so there won't be a, a list as such as to what a reasonable well I think there will be a list of some description um that my concern is is the, the omissions from any list that you create okay. so that, that so there you know there will be a set of criteria which are considered reasonable uh, for termination of contract you know that could be uh, a, a tenant simply not paying their rent it could be they're destroying the property you know those kind of areas um, and you know these are obvious situations whereby absolutely a landlord should be entitled to uh, remove their tenant um, yeah. Can I just pick up on, on that one a bit? Yeah. I mean, I think care needs to be taken not to create a massive red tape in a situation where you've got people damaging property. Yes. Yeah. The landlord will want them out now. Yes, you know, no, I, 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 I... And uh, yeah, we don't yeah. want to have to go through a process of perhaps having to go to a tribunal, which we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. and make it difficult. So I think the, the reason why, uh, go back to the point made earlier as to why we're taking the approach to, to do this uh, very comprehensively rather than individ on an individual basis is that different parts of the law have to come together. Um, so that comes with an enhanced evictions process that we are looking to uh, introduce. And that's to make it um, easier for the eviction process on both sides um, of, of the party to um, uh, most likely engage through a tribunal process rather than escalating directly to the Royal Courts, which can uh, be a very lengthy process and quite an intimidating process to go through. Um, so these things come as a package for a good reason um, in that there, there is the matter of open-ended tenancies and when you can naturally end a tenancy because of um, unacceptable behaviour with a tenant um, or when you can evict a, a tenant because of unacceptable behaviour. So these things have to come together. Thank you. Sorry, Mary. Um, we're still on the sort of... Uh, will you actually um, provide a definition um, what constitutes both a legal and illegal eviction to provide a basis of understanding? 
Go on. Yeah, so again, again that comes in the detail of the law drafting. We'll, like, we'll, we yeah. would take specific um, uh, legal advice on that point to make sure that the um, the law is as functional um, as it can possibly be. I'm sure there'd be arguments for and against um, uh, setting that out in the legislation that we would have to work through very carefully. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, Minister, we note that new provisions will be added to make it an offence for a tenant to sublet a property without permission. Can you provide data with regards to how many cases of tenants subletting properties are known? Hand on heart, no. I don't know what the number would be. So, uh, I, I, so th these are provisions that are um, included off the, the back of experience from environmental health officers who face these sorts of issues on a regular basis. Um, uh, so, you know, that, that, the, the paper sets out that some of the inclusions are because of um, real-time experience. I don't have data to hand on how many cases uh, of that nature have been um, highlighted. Um, what penalties do you anticipate being put in place for those found committing this offence? It's a subletting mm. offence. Um, so, again, that gets down to the, the heart of the, the balance of the, um, uh, whether or not it's... Uh, um, <coughs> by a fine with the environmental health officer if it has to be escalated through the tribunal or if it's a matter of the courts this the the relationship between the diff the treatment of different offenses needs to be very carefully um uh, measured and evaluated which we'll be taking legal advice on so it could be any one of those things and the most appropriate route will be determined as the the detailed uh, law drafting takes place so can i just um, ask would that be considered as a reason for eviction subletting mm. So again, that, that, as a matter of detail in the policy, that's something we will have to consider um, in the drafting. So if people have sp specific views about that, then we would encourage them to make those views in the consultation so that we can take account of that detail. There's subletting and there's taking a few pounds off your child to contribute towards board and lodging, of course, which is you know, a bit of a, a, a fine definition, isn't it? Would you call that subletting, for instance? I don't. I don't think we would call that subletting. No. So subletting being the case of you know the tenant has a um, a is, is the person party to the agreement. They vacate the property and somebody else enters the property. That would be yeah. subletting, yeah. not letting to well, not you know taking board from your child to so cover the rent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, well, we've we've heard a lot about housing tribun tribunal. Tribunal. Yes. So, sure. And uh, a number of questions get. Put to you, and I think the answer is quite often, well, the housing, tri housing tribunal will. Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, let's cut to the chase. When yeah. do you expect a housing or the housing tribunal to be operational? Well, again, this is going to be part of the law, and the, the, the thing which has to be bottomed out is the level, the scale of or the remit of our, any housing tribunal. So, again, that will be something which will come to the assembly um, towards <coughs> the end of this year. So we will have, you know, we'll have a far better, be able to give a lot more detail on that um, towards the end of the year. But I, I, as I and say... because the name has changed subtly. Correct. It's now a housing, as opposed correct. to a rent control correct. tribunal. Correct, correct. Do we envisage a greater number of members on that tribunal? I don't envisage a greater number of members. What I envisage is a, a tribunal which is broader in its remit. It's not just about rent. It will be about other issues, like we've talked about, you know, reasons why maybe a landlord wants to uh, pursue uh, the removal of a tenant or maybe the, a tenant has an issue that something hasn't happened. Which, and the, the point being at the moment is the course, a lot of the recourse is through the, the law courts. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to see what can we take out of the law courts because again people can find that very we've just come to here very intimidating very expensive what we want is we want these things to be easier to do to deal with and we but we need to understand how much legal right we can give um, a housing tribunal Th that's something that we need to work with law officers on and, and okay, understand so you've, got, you've got a broader tribunal yeah do you envisage a broader membership of that tribunal well, to cope with that again expansion? again that was a matter raised yesterday as who would be who would head up that tribunal and and whether uh, because obviously one of the reasons uh the tri we weren't able to get a rent tribunal was there was concerns over the the makeup of that um and i think we need to reflect upon that so again, as I said, whether we can be more specific, uh, I would quickly say there are two things. One is there aren't a queue of people waiting to join a housing tribunal um, for which there is no revenue, uh, no, no payment made. So these are people who are standing there 
because they uh, want to do good for their society. So um, I have to. I think we need to recognise that. So if we start becoming too restrictive and too determined by saying, oh, they have to be for this sector, that one has to be for this sector, we may well end up never having a core at housing. Uh, a tribunal. So I think we have to really think long and hard about how we make that, you, uh, do that make up. I mean, given the potential amount of work this tribunal may have to do, yeah. are you going to consider the issue of, you know, whether it's purely on an honorary basis yeah. or are you going to have to consider paying people? Well, to I, do I, think that, I think that's really important, a really good point. And I, I, I have to say, in this day and age, I think if there is more time, I mean, I think it's quite interesting, isn't it? The rent tribunal died a death. Um, whatever it was, 10, 15 years ago, and was and was deemed not being able to do anything, not doing anything. What we want is a very proactive uh, housing tri uh, tribunal. So you're right. I mean, if if the workload becomes such, absolutely, people should be paid. Um, they will have secretarial support, which is already, I think, in train. Can I? clarify that. Um, so we already have some secretarial support, but as you correctly identify is maybe we will attract more individuals to these posts if it is, if it's a paid, a paid post. Well, just paid post. Well, can, I, can I just ask what resources you have available allocated for funding a tribunal should you need to do that? So under the current government plan, we've got £90,000 allocated to a specialist rent control officer. Uh, we have appointed into that role because that, that recruitment process started prior to the conclusion of the rent control tribunal um, proposition uh, around Christmas time. Um, uh, those, those resources will be reviewed and reflected in government plan 2024, uh, which we'll be working on with ministers. And of course, that will come to the States Assembly uh, later this year. Just picking up on the point about the timeline uh, mm -hmm. for the implementation of the tribunal. Sure. Is it, uh, you suggested, I think, it would take a year, but should it not be really... Bit I, I didn't suggest it was a year. I, 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 you know, I believe that if we, if the estates approve uh, of, of approval of law towards yeah. the end of this year and we get we get over the line on that front and we then get this law inst instigated in the first quarter of next year, um, then I would I would hazard a guess that that's when the rent uh, not rent housing tribunal I should say uh, would would be be up and running. I don't know if we would. Sorry, Natasha may may. I think my, my point is that really in order to make the decision on the, uh, on the proposition that's coming forward, yeah. there needs to be an understanding of exactly what the tribunal is going to be doing, doing yes, and how yes. it's going to perform. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if I may clarify, um, on, on the appointments process uh, for the tribunal, that would have to be dealt with uh, within the legislation, much as it is at a relatively high level in the current dwelling houses rent control law. Um, the timing of the appointment of that tri tribunal will have to be very carefully managed because, of course, if it carries a great deal of responsibility relative to the application of the law, then they will have to be up and running by the time the law comes into force. Yeah. So that's something um, that we will have to factor in uh, in terms of when um, the law comes to life after it is agreed by the State's Assembly. There could be an initial deluge of work, I suspect. Mm. Well, I, I, I hope there will, you know, it will be an appropriate... Um, I, I don't say housing court of law, as it were. So, you know, I think it's. Uh, I, th I think it's. I think it's. I, I think it has a very, very. It's a very strong uh, part of this legislation. So again, um, I probably just highlight that you know, given these are quite significant changes and will affect many tenancies, uh, well, most tenancies in Jersey. Um, we would have to very carefully consider the transitionary arrangements um, upon the adoption of the law um, to make sure that we don't then have a major problem with everybody having to um, consider uh, their position or a surge in applications to the tribunal. So it may, there may be some specific transitionary arrangements that help to manage that. Is it too early in the process, mm. Minister, to have any detail around how tenants might lodge a complaint? Is that done with government officers yeah, or direct have, to the that's, tribunal? That's, that's long grass. I haven't got that far yet. And okay, then, and okay. then the powers of the tribunal to fine and and, and again, uh, th again, that has to be sorted out and resolved with law officers because I think we need to understand exactly what level of powers they can be can be uh, passed to. Then, do you have any expectation at the moment when cases may be escalated up to the courts, or is that again it's, detailed? If I can refer you to the white paper, there is a diagram in there that explains a, you know a broad scenario of how a complaint would pass through the, the process of um, you know first of all arriving on the desk of an environmental health officer, then considering the compl the initial compliance with the law, and if there's any action that they can take at the officer level, and the escalation route of that through a tribunal, and then ultimately. To so on that uh, that flowchart, then mm. the first complaint goes to the officer yes. and not direct to the 
So, so it really depends on the issue. We would envisage most things being dealt with um, at an officer level without the, the need for formal intervention. Um, and of course, that's I think you know in, in the spirit of, um, of of how we um, do compliance in in regulation activities that we would always seek to engage um, with uh, both parties to seek a resolution before that has to be escalated to any sort of formal action. Um, so that's a really important role that officers can play to support that process. Um, there will, I, I envisage um, there to be some circumstances that it's just more efficient for a tribunal to have a standard set of procedures where something can be dealt with very, very quickly. <coughs> Pardon, excuse me. Um, uh, such as it, it may be an eviction process, for example, um, but but ultimately um, uh, the officer kind of filtering point at, at the beginning is very helpful to say, actually, is there a breach here or is there a case to be made here so that it doesn't overburden the tribunal with cases that it actually can't deal with? And by the same token, we don't want to overburden the courts. So we're mm. expecting the tribunal to have fining powers and uh, that, other that would, powers so yep, that they can that would deal be my, with low, that would be lower level. Certainly, that would be my intention. In, okay. a, in a similar vein, really, in terms of um, in the section on property maintenance proposals mm -hmm. uh, discussing uninhabitable premises, yeah. it states that government officers and or a housing tribunal could be tasked with the serving of notices, determining liability and ruling on where compensation is due. So currently, aspects relating to these sort of premises fall under court jur jurisdiction. But given the recruitment difficulties faced across the public service. Do you anticipate the government officers will be sufficiently staffed consistently to respond to um, and provide resolutions in time-sensitive cases? Well, I was going to say, I mean, obviously a lot of this is under the Environmental Health Minister and or the, the Minister for the Environment. That's his, his kind of area of the law. Now, what he's doing is he's um, bringing in um, a, a law which will sort of identify, you know, um, Rent, or he's trying, I say bringing in law, he's bringing to the assembly uh, a law which is trying to identify, um, trying to find the word. Uh, Building his license. Yes, yeah, thank you, thank you. You know better than I do. Um, but, but the point being is that these, the, and, and this is the other point we're trying to make is in terms of resource, this is not a case of uh, government uh, uh, sort of uh, representatives going into all the premises and just checking out, checking them all out. This is an on-demand service. In other words, if there is an issue from a tenant or a, a landlord and they need to um, make, you know, make representation, then they, we react accordingly. So uh, I just, you know, we've just got to be very careful. We're not suddenly needing to hire a whole a, a raft of civil servants to, yeah. to carry out some of this work. So will government officers and, and the housing tribunal have yeah. a service yeah. level agreement when providing a, aid to tenants or landlords, contacting them, including provision of a certain turnaround time? Time, right. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I, 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 would, I would clarify that um, just because we have, a, um, you know, enhanced provisions for things like whether or not something's deemed unhabitable and, and action being able to take, be taken, there are other provisions of the law that help to manage that from the outset. So um, standard tenancy agreements, for example, that are much clearer in terms of the, relate, the the obligations of a landlord to their tenant in such circumstances and vice versa. So we spoke here about um, whether or not something is an accident uh, being the, the fault of the, the landlord or no fault of the landlord or, or the fault of the tenant. Um, having greater clarity up front on those issues means that there's less of an argument to be had because if it's, you know, if we, let's say a, a flood caused by you know, a burst water main, um, the clarity will be there right at the very beginning as to who's responsible for that, rather than, you know, you having a flood, you being in an emergency situation, you, you being unable to live in the accommodation, and then having an argument as to how, over who's responsible, that clarity will be there. So if government officers are tasked with new responsibilities as well as the powers of investigation, will this entail new roles being created with relevant experience, or will existing officers receive training to... So I think it's important to recognise that the residential tenancy law is in existence and much of this work is already undertaken, and most of this work is already undertaken by environmental health officers. Um, the key issue that they have is the inability to enforce the powers that they have because of a lack of clarity under the law. So they do a huge amount of work and then can't take it to the point of reaching a conclusion because they don't have the evidence or, or the, the powers to do something about it. So they're already doing so much work in this area these changes enable them to take action in relation to some of the issues that they are experiencing. I don't envisage this being a significant growing of the environmental health 
um, a department that's very much within their existing functions. Right, so um, within the section on residential tenancy law proposals, and the aim is to, uh, is repeated, is to achieve uh, more informal resolutions of matters. Can you elaborate further on how you would envisage this would work um, and the types of circumstances where you would believe it would be beneficial? So what would be the the, in, the definition of informal, should we say, um, at, before it got to the lower levels of well, the uh, tribunal? I, I think, as Natasha sort of mentioned there, you know, this is about transparency. This is about having some very clear uh, things written down within the tenancy law. So, uh, so that that for me is how how you know un, uh, informal uh, agreements are reached. Uh, that that would be my so that be my take on it. I mean, clearly, if there if there is a sense that actually this is really unfair, then um, that's where it gets escalated. So but you're, you're you're really looking for enhanced tenancy agreements. At yes, absolutely. Yeah. That would be my take. On. I think, I say think, enhanced, I think just... it's fair to say enhanced tenancy agreements that bring greater clarity. clarity. So from the outset, yeah. everybody's roles and responsibilities are much clearer. So you should have less disputes happening in the first place. Mm. Um, uh, but then the, the second part is about improving the relationships between landlords and tenants, where much of these disputes will come as a result of a relationship breakdown, uh, not because actually either party are prepared to do what's right and what's in their tenancy agreement. So the, the role of an officer in, in that will be um, to make sure that I think a point to highlight is that tenants quite often don't know their rights and you were talking before about um, <coughs> minority groups and people who have English as a second uh, language it's harder for them to understand a tenancy agreement and what that means for them so the, the role of the officer can support them through um, that process so you don't need to escalate it through um, a, a, perhaps a heavy hand a tribunal or court process it can be dealt with at a much softer level and Will you be proposing a, a mandatory uh tenancy agreement template of any description? So it's a standard form of tenancy. Yeah. So there's a minimum list within the current law as to what needs to go in a tenancy agreement um, and we would be looking to enhance that um, in the new law. I mean, other jurisdictions do provide templates. Um, is this something that might be helpful, especially to uh, non-native speakers, if you like? Yes, it is. Mm. And um, uh, what protective measures, if any, will be put in place to ensure tenants can anonymously report, let, uh, report landlords? And would this be to the housing tribunal or initially to a dedicated government officer? Yes, so much the same as what's been happening with the um, public health and dwelling legislation. Mm. The introduction of powers of investigation essentially helps to anonymise when complaints are made. So random inspections can be undertaken and therefore if somebody has made a complaint that may manifest as a random inspection rather than, a proactive, than an inspection that's come as a result of a complaint. Um, that is actually really very important uh, for the protection of the tenant and their, their ability to feel confident to raise a concern to, um, to government when they have one. Just finally uh, on this uh, section, do you envisage um, the tribunal um, being at the disposal of not only use housing minister but mm -hmm. also the environment minister? Uh, that hasn't crossed my mind at the moment, but there's, that doesn't sound like an unreasonable situation mm -hmm. you know, to do that, to share resource, um, absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think of a circumstance where that would be the case, but off the top of my head, I don't have one. Just, it but, seems in but conversation it, there will be crossover. There, absolutely, just, there absolutely is. Too there too absolutely is. And I think yeah. this is where a little bit of joined up thinking between the, de the departments is going to be really, really important to, yeah. to, to deliver on a lot of this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, rents and charges. Um, Minister, given the timescale of consultation and yep. various stages to form the residential tenancy law reform proposals, are there any immediate actions that will put in place will be put in place in the meantime to protect tenants from further rental increases? You're talking as of say tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I think we're we are at a situation where we're in the consultation period. Um, I, th I think it's unwise that we start doing again. We come back to piecemeal, don't we? Uh, we've got to get this sorted out. We've got to get this right. Um, I think there is current, as Natasha has highlighted, there is current legislation in place already. The 20, 2011 uh, law is still there. There are plenty of uh, proper uh, agreements out there already. Uh, we're, we're just we're trying to move on from that and uh, and that will take a degree of time but I, I keep coming back to the point it's important we get it right and we don't just uh, do some knee-jerk reactions which is what of which was the biggest concern of mine if landlords can only increase rents once a year do you have any concerns that they may inflate the rises at the commencement of a tenancy agreement in anticipation of the upcoming 12 months 
Um, they might do, but I think on the other hand, you know, the market, I, I hate to use the term, the market is the market. They are in a competitive market as well. Um, so uh, clearly, you do, there are two aspects to that. One is you don't want to force your tenant out because they can't no longer afford to pay the rent. And secondly, you may not be able to because there's too much competition out there. Bear in mind, you know, Antium Homes is building, you know, thousands of new homes. There's going to be plenty of um, uh, accommodation out there over the coming 12, 24 months. Um, so there's going to be quite a lot more choice uh, for tenants. So I think, uh, you know, it's not, it, the, the market will determine that in a lot of ways. Um, codes of practice. Um, Minister, in this section, in the summary of policy intent tables, it states that the Minister may produce a code of practice. Can mm -hmm. you confirm if this is a possible proposal that you'll be seeking feedback from stakeholders on? Okay. Can you Yes, thank you. So, so the role of the, the code of practice is um, really to bridge the gap between what is often very technical legal provisions and what that means uh, for the tenant and landlord. And there sometimes there's some gaps to fill in between there in terms of what that a legal requirement, how that may manifest in practice in, say, let's say, um, at the form of an agreement or or how we would reasonably expect a relationship uh, between a landlord and tenant. So they can perform a, a very, um, very, very helpful role, and um, one that will help uh, uh, tenants and landlords better understand what is expected of them. Um, of course, you know, a, as a result of the consultation, we'll reflect if there's any gaps in what would be the statutory provisions and how we might bridge that gap with the, um, uh, with the uh, additional guidance. Um, finally, regulations and orders. In the section regulations and orders, separations are made between regulations or acts which must be made by a proposition adopted by the State Assembly and other subordinate legislation such as orders, mm -hmm. which may be made by the Minister. Mm -hmm. Minister, when do you anticipate being in a position to advise, after consultation and advice from the Law Officers Department, mm -hmm. which residential tenancy law matters will be dealt with as regulations or orders? I think that will just come out of the consultation period and we will be able to clarify, you know, have more clarity in that area. I, I wish I could be more certain than that. It's really difficult to, you know, let, let's see where we're at uh, once consultation is closed. Let's see what the law officers are suggesting. Um, I, I think the, one of the Im, intimations in all of that is that the housing minister will suddenly have this carte blanche role of being able to dictate everything there is. That's absolutely not the case at all. You know, there are going to be critical matters here which the States Assembly will have every right right to have uh, input on. Um, so I think, yeah, uh, let's see Let's see what comes out. Let's so you, you envisage more regulation than order, in other words? I, I Yeah, <laughs> who knows? I mean, what we've got to bear in mind is, and again, we come back to how we've got to where we are today, and that is that we have to have a law that is fit for purpose. So therefore, we have to have a law that's adaptable to current circumstances. And the problem is, if you keep having to go back to the assembly in certain areas, um, all you do is you delay, delay, delay. And, and we, we arrive at a situation where we end up with different legislation over the decades again. What I'm trying to do is, is trying to find a way that we can flex the legislation, which gives enough uh, flexibility to the minister to be able to be flexible in given the, as I described earlier, the changing landscape and be able to make order, because orders obviously will be able to change the laws, tweak the laws to, to make them more appropriate and fit for purpose. Um, but obviously, where, where that line is and where that becomes, you know, the Assembly's interest as opposed to the Minister's interest, I think we have to wait and see. OK, but before we move away from residential tenancy, Minister, I just want to run over a few little questions I've jotted down here mm -hmm. while we've been talking. I mean, what's your view on rent control? <laughs> I've been asked this so many times. There are, there are obviously different types of rent control, okay? So you have hard rent control. I, I think we determine these one, two, and three steps in, in rent control. One is a hard rent control where the, where the government determines what the rent is going to be on every single property, and that's clearly impossible. That's insane. So what we have to... So my view about rent control is around more around... Uh, rent increases, you know, how how often a rent increase can be applied, what level of rent can be applied, um, what circumstances are there whereby a landlord is justified in putting up rent above a certain fixed uh, area. That's what, that's what I determine as, as, as rent control. I do not determine uh, setting the baseline on, on a one-bedroom flat as, as being, that's not, as far as I'm concerned, that's no, I do not want to even begin to get into that territory. 
So you're not favouring rent control? Uh, well, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of, oh, I, I keep using the word nuanced all the time here. I'm aware of that. But, it, but it's, I, I, we, we have to recognise there is, there is a flexibility in here and that you know, landlords are entitled to charge what they feel is appropriate for their property. Now, once a tenancy agreement has been established, then I think then that's where we look at because, you know, we have heard one or two hor horror stories out there about, you know, double, double increases in a year, um, you know, uh, tenants being priced out of their, their homes effectively, effectively as, as a method of eviction. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, th those, those areas aren't, aren't you know. Do you, do you have a view on what the minimum time for an increase should be? Should it be 12 months? Should it be two years? Should it be well, less? Well, <laughs> Again, again, it, we're looking at an annual increase. We're looking to set a law which has an annual increase limit. Now, whether that's RPI or some measure, uh, some other measure, that's again yet to be determined. So that would be how we do it. I'm also conscious that there are people who have maybe a three-year tenancy agreement, um, which was highlighted to me yesterday, where maybe they don't put the rent up annually uh, by RPI or whatever it is, and then they come to reset. And maybe one of the issues is around if that if that's the same tenant who you're resetting the, the rent level with, and there's a sense that, hang on, we've got out of kilter with the market, how do we accommodate those those scenarios? Okay, so, and I think this is, again, a, a concern to, to, to landlords, and I think we need to look into that a bit more in a bit more okay. depth. Um, just moving back to the tribunal, mm. obviously a court, if you yep. ended up in the magistrate's court, would be independent Absolutely. of government and would be expected to, to act and make their own decisions. Mm. Do you see the tribunal absolutely being completely independent of yourself and your department? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I do not want to influence them. I mean, obviously, if there's public disquiet or something like that, then we'd be questioning what they're, what they're doing and what they're up to. But I, as far as I'm concerned, no, they're an independent body and uh, they, they make the, yeah, determine outcomes. Okay. Um, something else I wrote down here. It's, it's clear that we're trying to get away from subjectivity. So mm. we've actually got things defined. What is this? And what yep. is that? Is there a danger? And I'm kind of devil's advocate yeah, again, yeah. but is there not a danger here that we're going to have to have a 25 page tenancy agreement for every property on the island in order to accommodate all that detail? Uh, I, that's a fair, a fair point. I mean, I, I think it, it's one of the issues uh, uh, around transparency is how much level of detail do you go to when you're offering transparency? And I think what we need to do is we need to recognise the key areas for both landlords and tenants, which are, you know, headlines. Now, do we need to go into a lot more detail within the tenancy agreement? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, one would suggest that the if, if you find lots of things happening, appearing in a, a rent uh, a housing tribunal uh, and, it, and it's a recurring item, then one would have to say, well, we need to update tenancy agreements to accommodate this particular as aspect. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I say I, I just keep back, come back to the word transparency. It's just just more clarity. I, I don't see huge you know, reams of paper in that respect, you know, keeping better records of when the electricity uh, was last checked out or when the, you know, things that, uh, you know, routine things, things which I think most people using common sense would say that's appropriate uh, and, and reasonable. You know, I, I think we have to bear in mind this is, uh, this is we're trying to create a home here. This is a home. We're not talking about um, you know we're buying and selling products. You know the, these are, people have a right to a home, to live in a home, have a roof over their head, a human right we talked about earlier to have a have a roof over there. So there has to be some enhanced uh, you know regulation around around that. Um, and at the moment there are too many concerns uh, from the, the general public that there aren't sufficient rules around that. Okay. Um, final question regards uh, the length of tenancies, and we've spoken about short-term tenancies. We've mentioned three, and we know there's nine years. Yep. But you specifically mentioned the default position potentially being open-ended yep. tenancies. Yep. Now, can you just bottom this out? It does worry me considerably mm -hmm. that we could end up with a default position of open-ended tenancies. How how would that a situation arise? Okay. What process would we have to go through before we get to open-ended tenancies being the default? default? Would you like to? So, 
so there's a couple of things in there. I, I think, first of all, that establishing the principle of an open-ended tenancy being the default will come as a result of consultations. We have to very carefully consider um, the, the, the risks and benefits of introducing that and, and listen to both landlords and tenants um, in relation to those proposals. The second thing is thinking about um, that nuance that comes with um, the introduction of um, open-ended tenancies and um, the level of exceptions that will be attached to that um, that that there, um, and then in terms of the implementation of open-ended tenancies, that really comes down to those transitionary arrangements that I mentioned earlier, and that is that we don't want. Yeah, I don't think it would be uh, sensible to have that the law came in and overnight everybody had to update their tenancies. That would be uh, a very difficult thing to go through. Um, there may be some transitionary arrangements that when a tenancy ends, then the new tenancy becomes an open-ended tenancy. Okay, so it's not set in stone. No, no absolutely. Discussion and, mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. Uh, just going to move away to three other subjects under your remit, Minister. The first one is empty homes. Okay. And yep. could you just give us a, a very brief update on the uh, empty home service and progress mm -hmm. you've made and the numbers of cases yeah, you've I mean, the, the, the numbers of cases uh, uh, that have been reported to us so far are of the order of uh, 220. Okay, so one of the... Uh, uh, we're just... Um, Sort of going going through all of that. So what we're basically doing right now is we're triaging our way through all of those, uh, all of that. Um, there are three things which are being highlighted here. We, we were talking about this earlier. One was uh, the circ we're finding circumstances, home and individual. Okay. So what is the situation as far as the the property is concerned? Um, what is the individual situation? Um, and then we have the circumstances. That is, have we got uh, issues around? Inheritance? Are there lots of family members who want to do things or don't do and can't do anything? Um, we're finding properties what I call under the radar, uh, aren't you know on, under being um, under the rates radar, as it were. Um, you've probably seen us in the paper reference that we discovered one property which hadn't been uh, lived in. 1975. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So so it's a while, um, and but, and I mean, trying to work out and trying to work out why that that happens, why that gets stuck, why these things fall off the radar. So I think at the moment, as I say, we we obviously have a headline figure of 900 properties. We're, what we're endeavouring to do with this service, uh, and the, the, the raison d'etre behind all of this is, how do we use our built environment more effectively? How do we stop building on more green fields? So this is why we're putting effort in, into this area. And as I said, as we go through case by case, we're starting to get a picture of what uh, what the comp complexity okay, so well, is. Let's look at that picture. Yeah, yeah, sure. Have you got any percentages roughly that you can start allocating, you know, a third of these empty houses no. are empty because people are moving or and i think we are going to produce a report within i think it's six months end of june is it beginning of july when we're going to be reporting exactly that that detail we'll be able to give you that level of detail okay yeah. very very specifically the property you identified yes. that hadn't been used in yeah. 75 is there anything you can do? Where, well, where do you where where do you go where, to make use get that bring that well, property that's, back that, into use? And that's a really valid question. And this is this is obviously with the receiver general um, and uh, at, at this moment in time. And we are currently in conversation with with him to to see what the next uh, step is along this uh, along the route on that front. Do you envisage in the future maybe some legislation that might give you some power over properties which are not used? You're starting to get into compulsory purchase, <laughs> aren't you? Uh, territory. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we already have things like uh, empty dwelling uh, management orders, and there there are plenty. There are areas where we can, you know, up the ante, as it were, in in terms of that. So there's we're, powers there that we're not using. We're, absolutely, absolutely, and I, and I think, but we've just got to be very careful how we use those powers because it's not a one size fits all. You know, the the each circumstance is very unique to that property. So we have it's a very bespoke um, operation, and I think we need to understand uh, that. I talk about the data and how we how we what, what areas what what's our overall trends. Um, you know, for instance, this particular property there was no will. So as far as I'm aware, I don't clarify that there was no will. So therefore, it, it fell off everybody's radar because. You know, and with no doubt we will find other properties uh, in, in that of that. Well, I don't, I don't want to steal yeah. your thunder and the report will come out, but yeah. can you give us a rough indication of what percentage of the total number of empty properties you think you're going to end up 
bringing back, back into, into use. Uh, even that, I, I, I'm going to struggle with saying a number, putting a number to that. A rough um, percentage. Gone, gone, uh, well, Natasha, give you a, so, a good um, civil servant response here. Well, 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 <laughs> I mean, if you think of the context, we, we, you know, we estimated around 900 truly vacant properties. We were on track to have a third of those in the first quarter of the um, the empty home service being up and running. But, but those are homes that we are investigating and each one, as the Minister has highlighted, is a bespoke case review. Um, so at the moment we've, we've reviewed to the order of about 40 um, of those homes in quite a, a great deal of detail um, and we will continue with the reviews of those properties. So even when we get to that point of the six month report, we will not yet have had chance to review that whole backlog. And we're very keen to review that backlog because we're learning some very um, interesting characteristics that weren't on any of our radars, uh, really, when we um, commenced. We knew there would be some very uh, interesting uh, characteristics, but we're now starting to see patterns of what they are. So um, a, a, an issue uh, with the rates uh, system, for example, uh, where at the outset it was talking about uh, empty uh, property tax, and that would be a simple answer. Uh, it's not simple if these properties aren't even showing on the rates list, because you can't tax properties you don't know about. Uh, so th th there are some interesting things like that that uh, our patterns, I couldn't attribute numbers to them. There are issues with perhaps the rules and succession uh, law where, where things can get stuck in, um, in loops where inheritance issues don't get bottomed out or there isn't a worm and you, you know there are heirs but you can't find those heirs. Um, so lo lots of issues um, that are, are starting to form patterns but not yet enough to say definitively that there's a single answer. While, while dealing with empty homes is absolutely laudable, is mm. there a danger, Minister, we get to the six months, say 12 mm -hmm. months into this and find the cost of doing this is just doesn't okay. bear any resemblance to the result at the end. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'll highlight that half a million pounds was allocated to the issue of vacant homes and we will not touch anywhere near um, uh, that that level of funding um, in order to do the empty home service. So really it's the cost of an officer and an officer's time um, who is, is dedicated to doing these case reviews. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, but just because you have the money allocated, Minister, mm -hmm. doesn't mean to say you have to spend it. Is the cost justified? Well, well let's find out. OK. Let's find out. The, 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 cost, the, the cost is uh, is a post and an officer who's on a contract with government so not, not growth within the organisation to, to fund this. And we fully expect to spend way below uh, the very generous amount of funding that was allocated to this issue. Okay. I, this is a bee in my bonnet. Um, just one quick question. Um, have any of the properties that have been identified, are any of the reasons that they are empty due to the fact that they can't be developed because of their age and the fact of the rules that apply to what you have to do with certain types of buildings? So if you're referencing historic buildings, um, there is a... a Certainly a very big pattern emerging uh, relative, I think we could be calling it 19th century farmhouse pattern, uh, where the description is empty, end, beginning with that description. Um, so there is certainly a pattern with historic buildings, um, but that is in the context of farms that are passed down uh, into families, which then gets into the complexity of uh, inheritance. So it's not just about the fact that it's a listed or old building, it's that these are um, these are historic farming families who then uh, pass property on down the generations, and that's a different uh, issue altogether. But this of buildings um, it is certainly a pattern uh, that we expected to see. Uh, we've been working uh, with uh, officers in, in planning policy and historic environment where we have access to the Heritage at Risk Register, which is a very helpful starting point, actually, to see the historic buildings that are falling into disrepair through uh, a lack of an ability to maintain those properties and we will be referring back to um, the Minister for the Environment with a, with a new list of properties that we're saying there are some uh, very significant historic buildings here that are not getting the attention that they need because they are currently vacant and of course we won't be able to share the reasons that we might have established for those but very helpful for us to understand the extent of, of, of issue with historic buildings. Thank you. Well, I think there's one very much for the Environment Minister, but I think we all know, uh, Minister, that maintaining listed buildings is hugely expensive. Yes, yeah. And um, we know the view of the Department might well be that, well, if you're not prepared to do it in the way we tell you, it doesn't get done at all mm. and ends up falling down, which, to my mind, is Tragic. not acceptable yeah. either. Yeah. Anyway, we move on to uh, supply constraints. After the um, recent news that the Caran Construction Group, mm -hmm. which included Caran, went into administration, mm -hmm. what are your views on the stability 
and capacity of the construction industry mm -hmm. at the moment? And do you have any concerns that this will impact negatively on the delivery of housing for mm -hmm. Ireland? Well, I think uh, what's really good news is it has not impacted on Andium Homes, mm -hmm. who are still on target to deliver 3,000 new homes by 2030. So that's been really, really good news. They've managed to, uh, they were obviously working with Camerons um, uh, on particularly the Ann Street site. Uh, I'm trying to think of the current name of it. Um, it's not still called the Ann Street site anymore, is it? We know. Is, is it still a mock on site? Still a mock on house, yeah. So they've managed to keep that. They maintained uh, that, that, that sort of stream of work going. We've obviously got work going on at La Colette and the Limes as well. Um, there's just been absolutely no hold up at all, it, it, which, is, which is really, really good news and really encouraging news for, for the island. Uh, obviously, in the private sector, there are issues. The Masure now obviously have an, a major issue on uh, Bar Street with being able to, to progress that uh, area. But um, as far as we're concerned, and, that, and, and I can only talk about government uh, projects, uh, we, we're going to see no delay as far as we're concerned. Do you think any construction firm will continue to... Um agree to fixed price contracts given the supply chains are so difficult these days? I think that's a really good point. I mean, I, I think the reality is we've seen huge inflationary increases, significant costs going up. Um, I guess if you've entered into a fixed term contract, you, you would like to think you're going to have a, a friendly uh, a developer, as it were, who's who's going to accommodate the builders and increased costs and maybe adjust, adjust their quotation <coughs> accordingly. Um, uh, you don't have to, obviously. And, this and, and is, clearly, this, this has is, been the case with, uh, um, with Cameron. Do you anticipate uh, different forms of contract? Well, I, um, I, open I, I as, a, as a business person myself, I would expect a lot more flexibility. I mean, this is if you want to put in mortgage terms, this is the difference between you know fixed term mortgage and a and a and a, and a sort of a variable rate mortgage, isn't it? It's kind of uh, how do you you know. You, you have to determine what you're going to do, what level of risk you're prepared to take um, as, as a builder, as a, as a, as a developer. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a market issue. It's not something that I, as, as a housing minister, can actually turn around and say, this isn't the right well, thing to I, do. I, I think they, these guys have to mitigate their own risks. Yeah, well, well what a question I'm asking really is, have you got confidence that future developments will actually well, be implemented? I, I have confidence in that, yeah. Yeah. Um, another constraint on the potential delivery of necessary homes is the need to update the uh, drainage systems yep. uh, in the island generally. Yep. What, do you have any concerns how this might impact housing delivery? Well, uh, you know, we, we have concerns in both areas. We have concerns in La Colette as well. Um, and I think I was reporting in the paper today as saying, you know, we need to resolve these major, major issues. Um, uh, it, this is not something this government is, is uh, a problem that they've created. This is a problem that decades of underinvestment, um, not following... Uh, I, 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 well, it almost beggars belief some of the things which have happened uh, prior to my term. But, you know, we've got to get over that. We are where we are. And, uh, you know, there's some major, major strategic decisions need to be made uh, to, to, to make sure we don't, as you correctly identify, hold up the supply of, of housing, of, of new accommodation. So you're, yep. a, uh, you're a developer. Yeah. Let's just assume you're a developer. Yep. Yep. You have a site where you want to put 40 homes. Mm -hmm. And you apply, and the infrastructure department say you can't build those homes because the drainage system won't work. Mm -hmm. Are you satisfied with that? I'm not answer? satisfied with that. No, no. So we, the infrastructure we... department should take that on board. They should okay. just. Except uh, well, I, they I, need to take I, I think it's already recognised. I don't think it's a case of me telling them some, something that they don't already know. You know, we, it is absolutely recognised that a major investment uh, has to be made in our in our system. The, the question is, is I, I guess, some ways, is uh, the mechanism. Um, but as I say, that's you know that's for the infrastructure department and and uh, deputy B&A uh, to to sort out. But he's very conscious that 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 is this is an issue with regard to delivering homes. Okay, finally almost there. Okay. Homelessness. Oh, yeah. yeah. Minister, please could you provide an update with regards to the work being carried out by the recently established Housing Advice Service? Sure. So, so one of the th slight frustrations I've had in terms of data, because I was hoping by the end of the first quarter to have some data, uh, better data about what's, uh, you know, the, 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 the scope of the issue, the scale of the issues and things like that. So what I'm what we're, I've been asked is, can we delay uh, providing that data till the end of June? Okay, so this is uh, Housing Advice Service. But they are doing a huge amount of work in this area. Um, and I, I think it's interesting. I was reading a report which was uh, way back in the day, a homeless report from 2020, 2021. 
um, which identified a, a number of the, the issues we have in this area. Um, and the housing advice service is one of the re reasons why it exists, because that came out of that report. Um, but in terms of the numbers, we, I'm, you know, I can give you some individual numbers. For instance, we've got, uh, as of 24th of April, we've got 27 under 25-year-olds uh, in JYF. We've got 111 individuals in shelter, one in refuge. We've got 24 um, on the waiting list in sanctuary. And we've got issues in Causeway. The total number, basically, is 175 in the homeless category at this moment in time, as measured currently. And I'm not, as I said, I, I think that is, as we measure today, that's not a, a I, I'm not convinced by that figure in, in the round because we need to g dig down into that a bit more. Do you see trends, Minister, regardless of how you calculate the number? Yeah. Is your number increasing? Well, I think the, I don't know that the number is, the number may be increased. Again, that's a very difficult one to do. It may grow in one area and decline in one area. But what I would say is that it's recognised that um, and particularly if you talk to uh, Sanctuary, uh, there are working people now who are unable to live in their own home, can no longer afford the rent, and have ended up in places like Sanctuary. And I think that's very, very uh, concerning. Just Is that information? Sorry, for sorry. The, for the record, because um, I know it's sorry. describing it's 11 on the waiting list for Sanctuary. Sorry, sorry not 20, 24. Sorry, so I put the figure the wrong way around. Okay. I, I take it this information is going back to other ministers around the council ministers' table, the, the one you just quoted about, you know, people in having to go to sanctuary. Yes, yeah. Working. I mean, obviously the social security minister is, is obviously there and, and helping and, and giving support, you know, with uh, on that front. Uh, clearly one of the other areas and one of our objectives is to deliver more social housing and so to, to give more assistance there. I think there's also recognition that we need to be broader in our, in our, in our support and our how we organise support for, 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 for people who find themselves in very difficult circumstances. Um, th there's a huge amount of work, which is, I have to be honest, we've, is, is ongoing right now. And I think I'm actually very encouraged because I think over the next six months, we will have a very bet much wider, better idea of the scale, the issue, what provisions need to be made and what, how we need to uh, adjust our offer. Um, going forward. I, I feel very encouraged by that because I think we've got some very good people in the background working on that information. I mean, you've obviously talked about the sort of data and the understanding mm. and the extent yeah. and that of homelessness, but um, have you actually considered what new actions you may put in place to address it all? Do, do you want to say anything on that yeah. front? Yeah, Yeah. so um, you'll know in the Minister's Ministerial Plan that there's a, a commitment to continue to implement the um, accepted recommendations of the homelessness strategy. Um, it, it's actually only in this last week that as officers we've been reflecting on that, those, that long list of recommendations again and how we may uh, refresh those in light of the, the, the ever-changing circumstances around the issue of homelessness. Um, one of the key things um, that the Minister's uh, uh, Ministerial Plan highlighted was the need for a whole system response to this. It's, it, housing is very much um, the symptom of what is a collection of many different diseases um, and that, that could be uh, issues in the housing market affordability, that could be matters of al alcoholism, drug dependency, relationship breakdowns. So there are many, many issues that lead to the issue of homelessness and if, if, if there was any thought that the Minister for Housing alone could solve that issue, uh, I don't think we would uh, ever get to the end of the issue. So I think we need to refresh that piece of work and that's what we are looking at at the moment. Thank you. All right, thank you, Minister. I don't know if Just I... uh, one, if I, if I may, uh, I, I think there is, um, uh, I, I know what you're saying, we need to uh, rationalise a, a raft of existing laws, mm, mm. but would you not agree there is a risk of creating additional red tape here, and are we not using a sledgehammer to crack it? In, in what area? In, in, ha in homelessness? In your, in your proposed um, uh, paper, the, if you're... Residential tenancy law? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely not. I am absolutely of the opinion that... This is a way of bringing an awful lot of things which have been going on and not been dealt with for year after year after year and bringing them under one roof, under one uh, legislative... Uh, I, 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 I know that, can be a, that could be a perception. However, even in the short time I've been housing minister, I've seen too many things. Uh, too many things have been referred to me, uh, you know, various ministerial decisions I've had to make. And I think when you sit where I sit now, and I obviously used to think it was a lot easier when I've sat outside of the assembly and now I sit on the inside and the information that I'm given and have seen, uh, you know, 
housing is just this key issue. It's not just Jersey. I know it's it's a it's a key issue across the whole of sort of Western Europe, and we've got to get a handle on it. And I fundamentally believe that in Jersey, with one hundred and three thousand people on this island, if we can't get a handle on this, no other jurisdiction's got a, a hope in hell. So I, I really do believe, and I I just want people to dare I say it, trust the minister. If anybody can ever trust a politician, trust uh, trust the minister to try and get this right. And I think trust the assembly to get it right as well, because I think it's it, this is not just a journey for me. It's a journey for the assembly as well. And you, we're looking at, a, I, I repeat myself, a once in a decade change to update to the legislation, um, which will, I don't say solve all the ills, but it will go a long way to assisting those people who are, again, probably, most, dare I say it, most vulnerable in our society, as, as well as give clarity to those people who are providing the, the accommodation on this island and the, it, that they need. Do, do you think, I mean, I, my, my view is there are a lot of very good landlords on the island. I absolutely there are, agree. There are a few rogues. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Is this, but, is but this it, dis, a disproportionate But isn't this, isn't this a law, isn't this the problem with laws? We, we bring laws in um, for the, the, the those people who break the rules. You know, we don't bring laws in for people who stick to the rules all the time. And and we've just got to recognise that. And I, I, you, you, you do make a point, you know, let's be careful how we do that. And that's why we're consulting so heavily, because we do not want to get this wrong. It's too big a deal for all parties for us to get this wrong. So I think it's, uh, and, that, and again, this is why in committee debate, we're working very, very hard to communicate outwards, um, you know, how complex this issue is. Um, and we've already seen in a very short period of time, quite a few people get quite angry about things. And then we w want to explain in a bit more detail that actually, please don't get angry. Let's talk about this. Let's think about this in a rational way, because it's in the interests of everybody. And as I come back to the landlords, we recognise that private sector landlords are a very important component as uh, providing housing on this island, uh, accommodation on this island. So we are not out there to frighten the, the landlords, but we have to find a balance between landlords and tenants. And the quick way to consult is across, uh, you know, across everywhere. So, so we've got people. What, what's the well, the, 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 address, the email address we're going to send yeah. to? Email address. What email address? Oh, housingmatters at gov.je. Housingmatters at gov.je. There we are. There you are. Very thank you. To do, but we no, 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 okay, well, I'm going to wind it up there, Minister. Thank you very much. Um, in committee a debate next week, we'll have a lot to mm. talk about mm. at our next meeting. Absolutely. We've had that debate and come out the other side of it. But for today, um, we're due to finish in three or four minutes, so that's mm. really good timing. Um, thank you for coming today, and no, we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Yep, thank you very much thank indeed. You.